Now this evening I'm going to give a short introduction to why we should remember the Covenanters and especially those men who came out or who were put out their parishes in October 1662 and after we sang another part of Psalm 2 the Reverend Gavin Beers will bring to us a message from the Word of God. We're thinking this evening in particular about that period in history where the Covenanters were uh, so much persecuted and they suffered so much. We're talking about a period from 1637 to 1690, roughly. And if you are going to read a secular historian, he would give you a very different picture about the struggle of the Covenanters. It's a natural man's view of these things. But we come tonight from a different perspective because we come from God's perspective of it all. It's God's story. That's what I want to think about tonight. And when we think of what the struggle was that culminated in the covenants in Scotland, we have to think first of all of the dark period that preceded the Reformation in Scotland. We had the Celtic Church in the early centuries and then we had the Dark Ages when paganism prevailed so much in our land. And then when the Roman Catholic religion took over and we have in that respect the dark darkness of religion. But then in the Reformation light broke through and the truth was resurrected and life was imparted. But you see, the darkness was not completely eliminated. And when John Knox speaks about the struggle of the Reformation in Scotland in his day, he says thus, Did light and darkness thrive within the realm of Scotland? Darkness was ever before the world, suppressing the light. And that was the struggle that John Knox experienced. And yet, by the grace of God, he triumphed. And we had in 1560 a reformed church in Scotland, at least in name. And then we had later on the Presbyterian, Presbyterianism established in 1592. But then you see, opposition again arose. And this was not so much the opposition of Rome, but the opposition of the Stuart kings. They maintained that they had the divine right of kings and they thought that they could do what they wanted in the state and in the church and they imposed their will upon the people. And these kings professed religion but you see it was a type of religion that suited their way of life. Episcopacy, bishops, liturgy and so on. And the divine right of earthly kings was in contradiction with the right of King Jesus. And they failed to acknowledge the right of King Jesus as the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the one who was king over the nations. But also they failed to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the king and head of the church, that the Christian's first loyalty is to the Lord Jesus Christ as his king. And so Charles I tried to impose upon the people of Scotland the bishops and Lord's liturgy. We have that memorable incident in St. Giles Cathedral where John Knox preached when there was that imposition of the liturgy upon the people in Scotland and Jenny Geddes through her stool at the presiding a priest and there was a riot occasioned there in St. Giles. And because of that the people were stirred up against this imposition that was made upon them and they all came together and signed a national covenant in 1638 signed that covenant in Greyfriars Church first of all then out in the churchyard 
Some of them, we are told, signed it in their blood. And then that a national covenant was sent around all parts of the country and people signed it. And that covenant was upholding the reformed doctrine and the reformed government and the reformed worship. And the General Assembly in Glasgow in 1638 confirmed that as the, as the doctrine and government and worship of the church. And then, of course, that period was followed by the civil wars, by the Commonwealth under Cromwell. But the Scots had this love for the kingship, and they wanted to crown Charles II as their king. And when he was restored as the king of Britain in 1660, then the floodgates opened against those who stood as covenanters for the National Covenant. And the leading covenanters were executed, men like James Guthrie and Samuel Rutherford were summoned to be executed as well, but God called them home before that could take place. But then Charles II went further and he rescinded all the acts establishing Presbyterianism and the Reformed faith and he rejected the National Covenant although he had signed it at one time and the Solemn League and Covenant. And then by an act of Privy Council those ministers who were faithful to the Covenant were told that they had no longer any right to their benefices, to their stipends or to their monses and they had to be removed from their parishes. And that's what took place on that occasion on the end of October 1662. That was the Archbishop of Glasgow at that time thought that there wouldn't be more than ten who would refuse to conform. But in the end, 400 ministers, mainly in the south and west of Scotland, refused to conform to what the government was imposing upon them, what the king was imposing upon them. This is how the great historian Merlin Binia speaks about that day. It was the last Sunday of October 1662, a dreary and dismal day, in which nature itself seemed to sympathise with the sorrow of all hearts. All ejected ministers that day preached their farewell sermons to their flocks, in many places the people were unable to control their feelings. The desolation began in the west, but it spread to the south and centre of Scotland. So a great extent of country was suddenly deprived of comforter, guide and worship, and left in complete spiritual destitution. The ministers quitted their much-loved flocks, and many of them repaired northwards to the highlands beyond the Tay exposing themselves and their wives and children to all the inclemency of a Scottish winter. Their parishioners longed, followed them with their prayers, and when at last they lost sight of them, they gazed mournfully on these sacred walls, which alone reminded them, remained to them, now no longer echoing to the word of God. And one of those who was ejected was, of course, Alexander Peden, whose memorial is across the road there. And he was leaving the church at Glenluce after a three-year ministry in that church. And as he was going, he knocked three times on the pulpit door and three times uttered the words, I charge thee in my master's name that no man ever enter thee but such as come by the door as I have done. And that proved to be true because there was no minister settled there until after the revolution. And the ministers, or the curates who filled the places of these ejected ministers, they were no creatures at all, and they were even a disgrace to their order. And so the people followed the ministers. They went out to the moors and to the hills, because they loved the preaching of these ministers who were ejected, the men who preached Christ and him crucified. And so there began the field preaching and the conventicles and the great communion seasons held out 
in some of these places. And these men were, and women were hunted down by the authorities. And you can't blame them in some ways, but they took up arms to defend themselves. And we have a succession of battles, Rallyan Green, Drumclog, Bothwell Bridge, Ayers Moss and so on, which many of them were killed, but much more, many more of them were imprisoned and sent abroad and so on. And all these people suffered so greatly during these terrible years of persecution. And yet God had great men to lead them. We think of men like Richard Cameron, Donald Cargill, James Rennie, who fought for Christ's crown and covenant and who persevered to the end. And in the end, they saw a deliverance and brought freedom once again to the land and to the church. And I just want to think of what these people were like. Well, they were a people who lived close to God. And they were assured of eternal life. And that's what kept them in the midst of these persecutions. And if you read their dying testimonies, and how many dying testimonies of the covenanters are left to us, what assurance they had that they were God's people and that they were going to be with him, even up to the scaffold and the cruel death that many of them suffered. And secondly, they loved Christ as their Saviour and King. And in no way would they surrender their loyalty to Christ. They loved him and they served him and they died for him. And thirdly, they wanted a conscience void of offence. Above all, they upheld their integrity. With them there was no short measures, no compromise, because it was the kingship of Christ. But also they valued the freedom and liberty that was so dearly born. The freedom and li- liberty that we got at the Reformation and in subsequent times. And they fought for that freedom and liberty to worship God according to their consciences and in accordance with his word. And that's what they stood for. And they persevered unto the end. And they triumphed. Yes, perhaps an ordinary historian would say it was all such a tragedy. But we know it was not in vain. It was not in vain. And history is repeating itself. And that's what we want to to finish with. What can we learn from the Covenanters today? Well, we can learn this. That the battle is still raging. That battle that John Knox spoke about between darkness and light is still going on. It was there in the time of the Covenanters. That was the secret of what was happening in this land at that time. And uh, Hugh McHale speaks about the Church of Christ being persecuted in every age by a pharaoh on the throne, that was Charles II, by a Haman in the state, that was Middleton, and by a Judas in the church, and that was Archbishop Sharp. And you see, what's happening today is a repetition. The state is imposing its will upon the church and upon Christians. They're legislating to do away with that Christian heritage that was so dearly fought for and so dearly bought by our covenanters. And we have to resist as our covenanters did. That oppression of the state over the church and over the people of God. But then the second thing, and it's so relevant I think, and that was that there were these false brethren within the movement. Men who were very ready to compromise. And many who were ready to shift their their views as Archbishop Sharp did. He once was a covenanter. And he went against them and he betrayed them. And yes, they killed him and we cannot condone that. But you see what he was doing. He was working from within. And so there were those who were condoning what was going on. 
There were those who were taking part against the covenanters. They were persecuting them. And the thing about this is that it's not blindness, that it's religious blindness. And we've got to remember that in the church today. There are those who are making statements about the current issues in the church and so on. And it's because of their religious blindness. There's that knowledge of God that they are suppressing and they've got to have another kind of religion. But you see, that religion is darkness. And those who don't go along with them are accused of schism, of causing disunity. But you see, that's the devil at work. And we've got to see the hand of the devil trying to undermine even within the church, the professing church today, just as he did in the times of the Covenanters. But let us not be discouraged. What a powerful movement of God. There were revivals during the time of the Covenanting period. There was great preaching, conversions, wonderful things. And as George Whitfield said, persecution and the power of religion will always keep pace. You know, persecution times have been at times very often of greatest blessing to the church. And perhaps that's what's going to come to us in this nation again. But don't let us be discouraged because God can use that to revive and to reawaken and to make his people more powerful in the land. So let's give thanks tonight for the memory of those men and women who lay down their lives for the kingship of Christ, for Christ's crown and covenant. Please turn again in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. As you do so, let me give a word of thanks to the Scottish Reformation Society for organising this meeting, having the idea being the driving force behind a commemoration uh, to the Covenanters in this very significant part of Scotland where many of these men served and witnessed unto death. Let me also give a word of thanks to the Covenant Baptist Church for allowing us the kind use of your hall for this meeting. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth. All in all. Amen. What would you give up your salary for? Those of you who are preachers. What would you give up your pulpit for? Not your ministry. But your pulpit. What would you give up your home for? And drag your family to homelessness. And all of the extremity of a Scottish winter, as we just heard of. What would you do all this for? Then live under the continual threat of death. And perhaps, even very likely, die. 350 years ago, hundreds of men ministers, thousands of people who weren't ministers, did it for the kingship of Christ. You know we're here this evening to remember the stand that the Lord enabled them to make, to appreciate the heritage that has been bequeathed to us at this price, and therefore I want to consider with you this evening the doctrine and some application of that doctrine of the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the first thing we want to do is consider the king and his kingdom. And then secondly, the extent of his kingship. 
And thirdly, where we're going to base uh, the majority of our comments, we're going to consider crowning the king. We're going to get beyond doctrine. We're going to ask ourselves, do we have the same commitment to the same truth, but in a different day and generation? So first of all, the king and the kingdom. The first task is to show you that Christ indeed is king. And that he's king now. We're not waiting for him to reign at some future point in time. But he is already king and presently reigning. We want to do it in three ways. First of all, by considering his kingship prophesied. There are many places that we could turn to to consider this. But if you turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, you'll come to what is one of the most well-known texts that prophesies the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This text along with various others in the Old Testament declares the coming of Messiah the Prince. Who would be a king with a kingdom. The second thing here is his kingship declared. Because this one spoken of is in the fullness of time born into this world. And right at his birth the angels declare the glory of this king. Don't they speak to the shepherds who kept watch over their flock by night and declare him to be one born in the city of David. A saviour who is Messiah. The Lord. Then Matthew chapter 2, three kings come from the east. They knock on the door of Herod. Can you tell us? Where is he who was born king of the Jews? Turn please in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1 to see how Mark begins his account of the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. He begins it with the herald, John the Baptist. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. What do we have here but a fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy? A fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3 in terms of a herald who would advance before the king and his glorious party and maybe he would come into a town or a village and his message was very simple. The king is coming. Make ready. John says, I am the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. The king is coming. Now look at chapter 1, verse 14 and verse 15, where the king has come. And what does he say? Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. His kingship declared. Thirdly, his kingship Bestowed. When did Christ become king? Well, in reference to his eternal nature and person as the Son of God, he was Lord over everything from eternity. But we're thinking not of him as the eternal Son of God merely, we're thinking of him particularly. As the God man. Something radical happened in the incarnation. John Owen says he became what he was not. Without ceasing to be what he was. 
He takes flesh. He lives as the God-man, mediator, redeemer. It's the Christ, God-man, redeemer we're thinking of here. And we learn in scripture that his kingship was bestowed upon him by the Father, particularly in relation to his resurrection and his ascension. We catch a glimpse of it there at the end of Matthew's Gospel when he says to his disciples, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye and teach all nations all things, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. But you see, that was a fulfillment of this psalm that we've been singing this evening, Psalm 2, where the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing. And Peter puts that in the context of the New Testament as he preaches in the book of Acts. What was it all about? The promise to the Son from the Father that he would enthrone him and give to him the nations as his inheritance and the uttermost parts of the world for his possession. Thus we read of our Lord Jesus Christ in the text that we have referred to this evening, that he was exalted far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Why? Quite simply, as a reward of his sufferings. Because he took our nature and he bore our sin and he finished the work that the Father gave him to do. Remember how Paul writes to the church in Philippi and he says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Therefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. That's it. As a reward of his sufferings the Father has raised him to his own right hand and exalted him as a prince and a saviour. Now, before we go any further this evening, isn't it fitting that we stop here and remind ourselves that Jesus is king? The Jews got it wrong, didn't they? They didn't understand the spiritual nature of Christ's kingdom. Some Christians get that wrong too. They say the kingdom has been postponed. It's not now. I know. The kingdom is now. Jesus is king. And I know Christians don't mean to do so, but by postponing the idea of Christ's kingdom, they actually denigrate Christ's work upon the cross. Because it was as a reward of his sufferings and death that the Father has given him all authority, all power in heaven and in earth. The king in his kingdom. Secondly, the extent of his kingship. We've seen this kingdom foretold, declared, inaugurated in Christ's first coming. It continues now and it will be consummated at the last day. But where are we to look for Christ's dominion and his kingship? How are we going to recognize it? Well, the first thing we can say about the extent of his kingship is that he is Lord of all. He is Lord of all. Look at it in that text in Ephesians chapter 1, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above what? All principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all and what did Jesus say in Matthew 28 that text that we read all authority in heaven and in earth is given unto me 
That's the basis of our commission to go and disciple the nations. Not something that will be given to Christ in the future. Something that has been given to Christ. No, that he exercises the authority of the Trinity put in the hand of the God-man. And the Father saying to the Son, Reign! Until all things which are rightfully under your feet are put really under your feet. In history and in time. All things material and spiritual. All things seen and unseen. Angels and men and devils. The dominion of our Lord Jesus Christ is universal. If you want an illustration of it, you go to the book of Revelation chapter 5. And there's a great sorrow in heaven. There's this sealed book. Who is worthy, who who has prevailed to open this book? John weeps. The angel says to him, I don't weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the book. What is the book? It is the history of redemption. It is the unfolding of the eternal purpose of God. Who can open the book? The God-man redeemer. And he opens the book, chapter 6, and all of these seals start to be opened upon the earth. All in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Political upheavals. All kinds of physical convulsions in the earth. In the hand of our universal Lord. So he's Lord over all. Secondly, he's King of Nations. That should follow quite logically, shouldn't it? If he's Lord over all, then part of the all, he's going to be Lord over that too. He's king of the nations. He's not their mediator, as he is the church's mediator. But he is their king because he is mediator. Because the Father has exalted him to his own right hand. Therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ has the rightful dominion of all nations under heaven. He is, we are told, prince over the kings of the earth. Well, that's what we have in Psalm 2, isn't it? This plot to overthrow the government of God. God just laughs. And the very scheme that these men hatch to destroy the Messiah is the very thing that puts Messiah upon the throne. Let's kill him. Let's get the Romans to crucify him. God just laughs. Yes, do that. And where do you see what I do? I set him on the throne. I say to him, ask of me and I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance. And then he warns men, doesn't he? I shall break them. With a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces. Like a potter's vessel. Therefore kings be wise. Be taught ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Why? Because this universal Lord. Demands your allegiance. Kiss the sun. What does that mean? Children how do you think about a kiss? Maybe you see your mummy kiss your dad. It's a kiss of love and affection, isn't it? Not this kiss. Maybe you've seen in a film or read in a book of those who would come up and kiss the hand of the king. Or they would come up to the ruler and maybe kiss them on both sides of the face. What were they doing? They were saying, you're my king, I'm your servant. Here is my act of homage and submission to you. Kiss the sun. That's it. The act that kings would normally receive of their subjects, they are now giving unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, but everybody ought to do that, you say. That's kings in their private capacity. Tell me, were they in their private capacity when in verse 1 and verse 2 they're hatching a political plot against the Lord and his anointed? Now, in the same capacity as they hatch that plot, they must now submit to the government and yoke of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
He's king of nations. But then he's also king of the church. In this way, he is a special king. He's a king to the church in a way that he's not the king of the nations. He's the head of his body. He's the husband of his bride. But you see, that body must submit to him in all things, mustn't it? That bride, in Ephesians chapter 5, we're told, wives submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. After the pattern of the church, who is subject to Christ in all things. He's the head of the body, he's the husband of the bride, he's the king of his kingdom. God has set him on the holy hill of Zion and said, the increase of his government and peace shall know no end. So there's a brief overview, a very brief overview of the doctrine of the kingdom of Christ, the kingship of Christ. The king and his kingdom and the extent of his kingship. Now for us this evening, thirdly, crowning the king. We want to apply the doctrine. Well, I've just said he's universal king, haven't I? Therefore, there's universal application. And if I were to attempt to give that to you this evening, we would be here for a very, very long time. Therefore, I want to limit our words of application to Christ's kingship over the state and Christ's kingship over the church. Because it was those aspects of the kingship of Christ and how they relate to each other that our covenanting forefathers were so tenacious in the defence of. 350 years later, in a different situation nationally, in a different context religiously, my question to you this evening is, are you as committed to this doctrine as they were? Christ must be crowned in the nation. Christ must be crowned in the nation. In other words, our nation must, not may or should, must submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the explicit teaching of Scripture. I only wish we had time to go through and look at all of the glorious prophecies and promises, predictions and teaching of the Word of God that established it. But the covenanters saw it. And yes, they defended the kingship of Christ over his church, which we'll come to, but in every national covenant that they entered into from 1581 through 1638 and again in 1643, each one of them bound this nation to rule according to the righteousness of the law of God in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ as king. And they were absolutely right. But you know and I know that there has been for a long time political confusion and anarchy in our nation. You take such claims to our leaders today and they'll maybe give you a wry smile. They'll patronize you. Oh, the Bible, Christians. Oh, if you were a Muslim, you might get somewhere. Heart skirt of Muslims, they blow up airports and things. Not Christians. You can just laugh at Christians. Does Alex Salmond have to submit himself to the word of God according to his thinking? Not at all. And thus they rule with no respect to Christ and no care for the righteousness that is found in his law. Where will we get our laws? Public opinion. There you go. Let's have a referendum. Let's see what the majority want. But of course what the majority want changes every half an hour. And so do the morals and the ethics and the laws of the nations. That's why you who have lived from the 50s through the 60s, 70s and 80s have seen a total moral revolution. Because the basis of law is not God's law, it's public opinion. And then the media and the arts, they get to work with shaping public opinion. And the public public don't know that their opinion is being shaped. And we end up in the mess that we're in today. 
But then our leaders don't even give us the privilege of giving them our opinion. And they just make themselves a law to themselves. This is exactly what has happened in the same-sex marriage legislation. That hasn't come from public opinion. That has been driven by those who want to present themselves as progressives, imagining the minority is a majority. And in defiance of God, they're going to seek to redefine marriage, and with it, the whole social structure of our nation. Doesn't matter that it's historical, it's historically and culturally madness. The greater madness is its spiritual suicide. Just because they legislate for same sex marriage? No. But because in doing so they invite God to judge this nation. We're not into scaremongering this evening. This is the reality. We don't kiss the sun in our national life. He will be angry and we will perish from the way. We don't submit to him in our government and he will pick us up like a little clay jar and throw us off that wall. The nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, all those nations shall be utterly wasted. Do you know where that's found? In Isaiah chapter 60, one of the most glorious pictures of the advance of the church in the New Testament. Christ must be crowned in the nation. Well, we have a voice to raise, don't we? And one task of the church is to raise that voice prophetically to the nation. We're small, but we ought not to be silenced. Therefore, we need to lift that voice. We need to make it clear whether it be in letters or representations or public protests or face-to-face conversations with our rulers that the word of God teaches that which is contrary to the policies that they are pursuing. And if they persist in those policies, they will bring down the fearful judgment of God upon our nation. Now we may use other arguments concerning this whole matter of same-sex marriage. We might go and say, well, here's the existing legislation. If we change this, then everything else has to be changed. And this is the way it's going to affect the civil liberties of this man and that man and his workplace and this pastor and his church. And we can do all of that without ever mentioning God or the Bible. And some people are doing that. Well, it's okay if you do that and declare the word of God. But we must have confidence in the scriptures. And we must crown our king in the nation by proclaiming his word to the national situation that we find ourselves in. So we have a voice, we have to raise it. But you have a vote. Will you use it? Who are you going to put your ex beside in the next election? Maybe you're thinking SNP. Maybe you're thinking Labour. I doubt too many people in Cumnock are thinking Conservative, but you might be. How does that equate with the doctrine of the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ? The Conservative Party, the Scottish National Party, the Labour Party, the Green Party, and whatever party you care to mention, are not neutral, but they are violently rebellious against the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are out for the subversion of that which God calls good. We need to reckon with this. 
Can you say, I believe Jesus Christ is king and go and put an X beside somebody who's going to legislate for the murder of the unborn in the womb? Who's going to vote or his party is pushing a policy of redefining marriage in the nation? I would say to you that you can't. You might try to, you might have done in the past. I would say to be largely consistent, you can't. Therefore, Christians need to take the vote back. How are we going to do it? I think the only answer is to start Christian politics. You say, how, how are we ever going to make an impact? Well, that's God's business. We have to do what's right. I'm not going to do it. I'm a pastor. It's up to you to do it. You have a voice. We need to raise it. You have a vote. You need to use it. Christ must be crowned in the nation. But then the second thing we can say here, Christ must be crowned in the church. Christ must be crowned in the church. The church must submit to to Christ in all things. Now that is why the men that we are here to commemorate this evening were ejected from their pulpits. They would allow no other king but Jesus to reign in his church. First of all, as Mr. Murray told us, it was the Pope. The Pope is not the king and head of the church. Well, we got rid of him and then it was the king. But the king is not the head of the church either. Well, we don't have the Pope claiming to be, well he does on paper, but thankfully he's not here. He's not in our face trying to impose his worship here in this church or in the church that I worship in. And the king's not coming trying to impose bishops to govern over your church or my church. But are we to imagine, therefore, we're safe and that all is well in the Church of Christ? No, we have evangelical popes. We have ministers who might wish to impose their will upon the Church. We have people, congregations, who want to impose their will upon the Church. And then we've got the tyranny of the youth movement that wants to impose its will upon the church. Well, you see, the minister's not king. The member's not king. The youth group's not king of the church. Christ is. And therefore, wherever his kingship is attacked in the church, however novel and nice and sensible it seems to be, we need to crown the Lord. Three areas. The first is we need to crown Christ in the church's doctrine. We start with the conviction that this Bible is all that we have to bring us and those who hear us to a true knowledge of God in Jesus Christ. And therefore we reject all of the additions and all of the unbiblical traditions of men in order that we might put them out of the way and clear the highway for anyone who comes into our church to know that he must come to Jesus Christ if he's going to know the Father. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We have to crown Christ in preaching the full orb and glorious gospel of sovereign grace Focusing unashamedly in the incarnation, in the atonement, in substitution, in propitiation, in heaven and in hell. Unashamedly. Without any apology. We crown Christ in the church's doctrine. But then secondly, we crown Christ as king in the church's worship. You know and I know that there are many churches in Scotland today who go astray on the first point. They don't crown Christ in their doctrine. If truth be told, they've no real desire to crown Christ in their doctrine. But people in such churches very 
unlikely will find their way to a meeting such as this this evening. But you say, we preach the gospel in our church, and I praise God for that. And I hope we can say, we preach the gospel in our church, and you can praise God for that. But it's something else to think that we're safe. Now it's in this second point that we begin to see that maybe our approach to worship tells us that we're not okay with the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you do in worship in your church? Why do you do the things that you do in worship in your church? I'm not here to start a worship war with you this evening, but I am here to probe your conscience to ask whether or not you base what you do solely upon the word of God and because Jesus Christ is king. How many ways to God are there? You'll tell me. There's one way to God. I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's the gospel way. Second question, how many ways are there to worship God? Well, you look at the church and you'd think there were a whole lot, wouldn't you? But there's only one. There's only one way to worship God. Who tells us how to come to God for salvation? God does. That's what these men died for, wasn't it? The doctrine of free grace and salvation. Preserving the gospel for posterity. God tells us how to come to him for salvation. Who tells us how to worship God? See an answer. God does. Now you and I might debate the finer points of what does God actually tell us. But there's no debate here. God does tell us. And we have to submit to what God tells us to do. Now here's the problem. So many of the worship wars that we find in the church of Jesus Christ today, the confusion and the frustration can be traced back to the fact that they never even ask this question. They don't submit to Christ as king over worship. Well, these men were rejected because they rejected all human impositions and all human inventions in the worship of God. If we were to ask them, how are we to worship God? They would tell us, it's not left to you to work it out. It's not left to you to make it up. It's left to you to do what you're told. But think about these worship debates. We sit down and we say, now how do you worship God? I worship God like this. Why do you worship God like this? Well, I think, the alarm bells should begin to ring, I think that God would accept this as worship. You say, very well, but what's the basis for you thinking God would accept that as worship? Well, I can't imagine for a moment that God wouldn't allow me to worship like that. Do you know something, friends? God doesn't allow worship. God requires worship. God commands worship. And if we don't give to God what he requires, it's sin. And if we give to God something that he doesn't require, something that he's never asked for, it's sin. Nadab and Abihu learned that to great cost, didn't they? In Leviticus chapter 10. Shall we have contemporary worship? Or shall we have traditional worship? No, friends, we will have scriptural worship. Because contemporary worship and traditional worship are really only two forms of the same anarchy. But one looks a whole lot more respectable than the other. Scriptural worship. There's a thing that goes around today called New Calvinism. And it's a strange thing because it creates 
different emotions in us when we begin to study it. We rejoice that men are coming to the Calvinistic doctrine of salvation. We rejoice in that. We rejoice that men are coming to a proper understanding of covenant theology. But New Calvinism says we'll reform the doctrine of the gospel but don't talk to us about worship. Very often. Do you know what that's like saying? We want Jesus as a priest but we're only going to take him as a half king. We mustn't do it. Now you say we've heard enough about this about worship. Surely it's not that important is it? What would you give up your home for? What would you give up your house for? What would you give up your security, your health for? What would you give up your life for? These men gave their life for worship and government. The worship and government of the church. And the church today is so blasé about it. We must crown Christ in the worship of the church. Thirdly, we must crown Christ as king in the government of the church. We must crown Christ as king in the government of the church. These men were ejected because they resisted state intrusion into the government of the church by the king. They rejected and resisted the imposition of bishops because they could not find such offices in the word of God. Well, we don't face that, do we? But again, we would be wrong to to conclude that we're safe from state intrusion. Mr. Murray has already referred to it. I thought he was going to steal all my thunder on this point. But we do face state intrusion. And I dare say you're sitting there thinking, yes, and we look, it looks like we're going to be facing even more state intrusion into the church. Because the state wants to tell us what we can say. And what we can't say. What we can believe and what we can't believe in a progressive modern society. I was coming back from our presbytery on Friday night late and I was listening to Radio 4 and they were doing a roundup of the week's politics. And I listened with alarm and fear as the man was reviewing how legislation was attempted to be passed through Parliament last week that would deny religious groups and churches the ability to discriminate according to sex. That will just be passed over. What are they talking about? What would be the implications of that? Well, if you didn't have a woman who felt called to the ministry or in some way discriminated against that woman in your church holding her back from office, maybe there might be legislation for her to sue the church. Or if you had a minister and two, three years down the line he dropped the bomb, actually congregation have been struggling with this for a while, but I'm actually homosexual. And you said, well, sorry, but according to the word of God, you can't be pastor here anymore. And there was legislation for him to take you to court for discrimination of his human rights. If that's not state intrusion, what is? Alex Salmon says, oh well, we'll bring this in and no pastor will have to perform any civil ceremony or whatever they call them. Listen, no pastor has to perform any marriage. He's not called to marry people. He's called to preach the word and baptize and administer the sacraments. He's there as a preacher and the state license him to perform the civil ceremony. But what about you in the workplace? What about you if if you say, well, actually, I can't do that thing because it's against my conviction. Where's your protection going to be? You can be sure that they're not going to take care to tie up all of the loose ends to protect you. And you will be persecuted more than me, very likely. 
Because you're out and about, in the workplace, exposed to these things. While I'm in my study and moving around the congregation, and pastoring the flock and preaching the word. We need to be ready for what might be around the corner for us. But this history fortifies us, doesn't it? And the doctrine that they stood on fortifies us, doesn't it? Was this not the very truth that Peter could stand before those who condemned the Lord Jesus Christ to death and say, have you never heard of the stone that the builders refused? You've crucified the Messiah. When they said, you better stop preaching or you're going to be thrown into prison. Well, you tell me, is it better to obey God or men? the kingship of Christ. We will not bow. We think of these great heroes like Alexander Peden over there, his monument, and we hear the stories about them, but there were thousands of people we will never know a thing about, women, young people, those who were so free of, in their personality, so timid. But this mighty king drove a spiritual backbone of iron into them and they refused to bend but the doctrine comforts us as well because he's not just king of the church and he's not just king of nations he's lord of all and didn't we read in Ephesians chapter 1 he is head not just over the church he is head over all things to the church what are the all things? Well, I suppose they include the persecution of Charles II, the killing times that we're focusing upon this evening. I suppose they also include Alex Salmon and his mad schemes for our nation. They include David Cameron. They include prisons and torture and death and loss of money. All things to the church. That means for the benefit of the church, for the advance of the church. When will the world learn that the more they persecute them, the more they multiply? We don't want to invite persecution on ourselves, but maybe we shouldn't be so afraid of it as we are. Because Jesus Christ is King. Now, one final thing. Reformed and evangelical churches today their biggest problem, even in the light of all that I've said about state intrusion, their biggest problem concerning crowning Christ in the government of the church is not state intrusion. Their biggest problem concerning Christ, crowning Christ in the government of the church, is Christian rebellion. Christian rebellion. That's where Reformed and Evangelical churches are in disarray. There are some churches, they don't even care about government. They've got such a low ecclesiology, we'll just preach the gospel. Of course, some groups have taken it to the point of not even having the sacraments as well. It's just the gospel. What would these men who were rejected tell us? Would they tell us that all of their concern was about state intrusion? No, they would tell us in the words of the Westminster Confession that our Lord Jesus Christ has appointed a church distinct or a government in the church distinct from the civil magistrate. They weren't lawless. They were all for church government. What do we find today? Well, the Bible says how elders and deacons, the elders are to rule ordain the plurality of elders in every church. Choose them from among the people. Here are the qualifications that you're looking for. The church says, oh, we don't worry about that. But some say, no, no, we're into that. We're going to have elders. But then nobody submits to them. Oh, we're not going to come into membership of the church because that doesn't matter. If we come into membership, we come in in our own terms. 
If we don't like things while we're in membership, we'll just leave. We'll choose our churches the way we change our TV channels or the way we shop up in Silverburn there. One shop into the next. Don't like that one. This one's nicer. Better off on here. Friends, that is the way the Church of Jesus Christ is being treated in Reformed and Evangelical circles. And Jesus says, obey those that have the rule over you. Submit to them. And if you don't submit to them, it's not just the elders you're not submitting to. It's Christ. Every time we thumb our nose at the church, every time we refuse church discipline, I'm off. Who are the elders to discipline me? I'm going to go to the church down the road. Very likely, you'll go to another church down the road very soon as well. When that church isn't to your liking. When we do that, professing to be the friends of Christ, we behave like the enemies of Christ. Professing to be the servants of Christ, we act as if we were his Lord. Do I want to overhype the authority of the elders of the church? No, but I don't want to wonder, stress it either. Do you see it? The church isn't there to meet all of our little desires and to dot every I that we have and cross every T that we have and to make us feel nice and comfortable and to give you a spectacular sermon every week. If another preacher comes and he's just down the road and he's a bit better, oh well, you know, just jump churches, it's all about me. Do you get the point? We need to crown Christ in the doctrine, in the worship, and in the government of his church. Well, let's conclude. We are thankful for the heritage that we have. We have. We're challenged by the courage of our forefathers, but we're fools if we don't learn for the present. The way that we are to express our thankfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ tonight is to crown him in our individual lives, to crown him in our ecclesiastical lives, in doctrine, in worship, and in government, and to crown him in our national lives. This evening is historical, but it's not about nostalgia It's about continuing the fight of faith in our generation in the same allegiance to Jesus. May the Lord bless his word to your hearts. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, we give thee praise and thanks for the glorious kingship of Christ. Oh, if we had eyes to see if we were stabilized in our hearts daily by the thought of the perfect control of our Redeemer, that all things are in his hand, all things are under his feet, history which is a turbulent sea to us is a sea of glass to him. We thank thee, O our God, that he reigns. And no matter what our lot is in life, his church will prosper, his purpose will come to fruition, and nothing shall thwart, but everything shall actually advance his kingdom in the earth. O oh, our God, send us blessing in these days. And if we are called to walk a path of persecution in thy will, help us to do so joyfully. And help us to share and fellowship in the sufferings of Christ. We ask in his name. Amen.